Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the third and final day of our conference, Consent Not to Be a Single Being, Worlding Through the Caribbean. Uh, my name is Ananya Kabir, and I'm Professor of English Literature at King's College London. It's my great pleasure to welcome you today um, to uh, the start of the final day, which uh, kicks off with uh, the fourth panel. Um, uh, in the conference. And uh, before I tell you a little bit about this panel, I just want to um, share a, a few words about the conference itself, especially for those of you who may have joined us um, for the first time today. Um, the conference, um, Consent Not to Be a Single Being, um, Worlding Through the Caribbean, takes um, the Caribbean and Caribbean thought as a starting point to reconsider global histories of art and contemporary public cultures. Um, as most of us um, uh, who are familiar with the Caribbean know, um, this is the uh, real, I mean, in my opinion, it is the crucible of modernity. And um, it's also um, um, related to um, different, um, different spaces, um, um, different spaces across the globe in a relational and archipelagic fashion. And indeed, these are ideas that have come to us from Caribbean thinkers themselves. And these thinkers, three of them, um, Edouard Glisson, Stuart Hall, and Sylvia Winter, uh, give us uh, the thoughts and starting points uh, for um, this conference. Um, we, um, we've had some amazing panels in the past uh, two days, and uh, they've, they've really uh, given us uh, the building blocks to take this further, um, this final day. Um, and uh, we will start with uh, then panel four, uh, which um, will show us um, through four presentations, um, the, how, uh, shall we say, um, public narratives um, from multiple regional perspectives about our globally entangled world. This indeed is the idea, the, the, the uh, founding idea of the larger um, program, World in Public Cultures, the Arts and Social Innovation, um, of which this um, conference is a part. I think our panel today, the, the fourth panel, which we are going to enter right now, uh, will really show us how indeed um, these uh, in entanglements um, that include um, and radiate out of the Caribbean um, bring into being what the panel title calls Caribbean worldings. So um, we are going to start uh, with uh, a presentation uh, by Alexandra Chang. What I'm going to do is uh, each presentation is 15 minutes long, um, and I will introduce each um, presentation and the people involved as we go along. So let us start then with um, Alexandra Chang's um, uh, presentation, uh, which um, is called Transition, Transformation, and Temporality in the work of Catherine Chan and Nicole Awai, who are two Trinidadian um, uh, heritage artists. Um, and uh, we are going to listen to Alexandra, who is Associate Professor of Practice with the Art History Program at the Department of Arts, Culture, and Media, and um, Interim Associate Director of the Clement A. Price Institute on Ethnicity, Culture, and the Modern Experience, and Associate Director of American Studies Program at Rutgers University in New York. Um, so uh, we are going to now uh, listen to Alexandra's um, presentation. And after that, um, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll be back to introduce uh, the next one. Over to, over to you, um, Alexandra. My paper is Transition, Transformation, and Temporality in the work of Catherine Chan and Nicole Awai. We are at a moment of transition, a moment of becoming, a moment that has been centuries in the making, a moment that doesn't call for the impossibility of going back to a time that once was, nor is it a call to manipulate our current structures as we are enmeshed within them. It is a moment for liberation and imagination. Within the break is instilled our present past, our imagined futures. I'm talking about this moment of impending future that's always closer than we thought. The climate crisis has made us aware of this, the violences we're now feeling, and we thought were perhaps buried far enough beneath the surface through time, have turned back to the surface, exasperated by the pandemic and this liminal moment where we see and experience death and the fragility of life and human existence. And the current order of things need to are being compelled to change. In terms of Sylvia Winter's framings of modernity and the human, we're threatening the status quo, this frame. 
Within this time, I want to look at the work of two artists, US-based artist Nicola Y and Trinidad-based artist Catherine Chan. I would like to see how their works engage with the world building and renewal within societies in transformation amid the incumbency perspective of the eco-crisis and the artist's relationship to nature. I'd like to start with the work of Catherine Chan. Chan was born in 1960 in Trinidad and practiced as a painter early in her career. She studied at Parsons School of Design, Carnegie Mellon University, and Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. She later worked in design for contemporary dance and theater in London and also for Carnival in Trinidad. This is one of the few surviving watercolors that she painted early in her career. During this time, she would travel along the coast of Trinidad with her friend, bringing along art supplies, sleeping on beaches, and waking early to paint the shifting light and morning mist. There was an overlook where you feel that you're engulfed with the mist and rain. Her relationship to water, mist, and sea are extremely important in her work, noting that Turner had once lashed himself to jet a jetty to feel the spray of the waves in order to paint the sea. She's also influenced by her father, who was a seaman and inventor, and would make things from his hat to tools to structures, this notion of making from what you have. Here's her work, Mirage, which is also um, based during this time. Chan notes that when she would travel on the roads in the North Coast in the 1970s, that there was so much mist that there was a mirage of water that would be created on the roads that would reflect the sky. Presently, she also underlines that these mirages no longer exist as there are too, there's too much traffic along the roads. Within this installation, however, um, it just in 2001, this is mirage. And um, in this installation, she uses water bottles and buckets, not as symbolic of plastic consumption, but of objects used every day and saved and recycled through use to gather water where clean water isn't available in the villages in Trinidad. She collected water samples and asked for these buckets from those who use them to gather the water. And so she brings forth the issue of the lack of safe drinking water, which continues to remain as a concern. Here are some of the buckets that um, she collected from people that she ran into in the villages as well and spoke to. Okay, here come the bajak. I'm just gonna, there we go. Uh, Chan is greatly influenced um, also by her artist circle's interest in natural history, but also in carnival design. Her work, Bakchaks, in 1990, opened for Peter Mitchell's carnival design for Tantana. She has designed an ant being here. She was influenced by looking at the window and seeing folks gathering parts from houses that were being destroyed and using them in their own homes. A gathering of parts and a notion of a combination of resourcefulness and survival and recycling and mentality and the idea of a worker ant in terms of this imagery. She created a pure colored sail that was atop a traditional moss sailor uniform and clown character collar in her design, which was also modular and could fold flat. And she was able to travel with these and to show the work outside of Trinidad. She notes that carnival design is the contemporary art of Trinidad with the work addressing social issues and the ways in which the artists who design the costumes are in conversation with contemporary artists, both domestically and internationally. She's influenced in the ways in which Noguchi, for example, was able to work with Martha Grant with design for dance. For Chan, her work has been influenced by time and the passage of time and the movement of the stars, sun, and moon, as well as Leonardo da Vinci's reference to the movement of the earth or mountains, even as he painted them. Her work, This is, where we breathe, this is What We Breathe, is an installation that she has created in multiple spaces, including in 2003 at the Radcliffe Institute, and also in 2017 in LA for the Circles and Circuits exhibition on Chinese Caribbean art at the Chinese American Museum. In this work, she brings together her interest in the histories of places and communities in modernist abstraction, engaging with the site and the use of limestone, for which the artist also brings in her interest um, in Italian fresco painting from her time living in Italy, and how fresco paintings last for centuries, this idea of the endurance of these works of the past into the present. The installation also, also references the dust particles in the air that we breathe and what is in them. The shapes of the particles are enlarged, referencing 16th century drawings of magnifying dust particles. 
The shapes of the limestone mortar are in fact shapes of people, of those who perished in the wars and violences that have happened during the time during the Gulf War, of the space shuttle that blew up upon re-entry into the earth, of the Saharan dust that blew across the sea to Trinidad due to drought and climate change, disrupting, disrupting the ecosystem from South America to Florida. The work is her imagining of the histories and pasts blowing towards her across the sea and her breathing this in through media images and literally through her breathing in this dust, being surrounded by this in her present. In her work, Another Life, made of net, cane, and ink, which was created for the Circles and Circuits exhibition in LA in 2017, this is um, the installation that was in the California African American Museum. You can see the influence of carnival as well as the shape of the winged figure again, similar to the sail. Chan notes that the winged figure is in reference to the importance of the image of the Jab Jab, Bats and Devil, Paradise Lost, Good and Evil, and the wing in terms of mythologies that are imbued in the characters and stories that are part of Moss. The winged figure also becomes a reference to those who have big, been victims to domestic violence in Trinidad, with each wing symbolizing one who has died at the hands of this violence during that year. Chan is concerned with the growing violence within the country, noting that she would never now travel along and sleep along those beaches that she had done in the past. Through the work, she ties together the changing social, political, and natural landscape and the passage of and layered time that she had experienced in, experienced in, her, term, in, in her time in terms of archives and intimacies of place, culture, and mythologies, stories of Trinidad and the entwining of people and the artist's experience of nature. Artist Nicole Owai is a, multi, a multimedia artist who is a faculty at the Department of Art and Art History at the University of Austin. Her work, Persistence, Resistance of the Liquid Land, that was installed for the Alchemy Exhibition at Brick House in 2018, references her interest in La Bre Pritch Lake in Trinidad and the idea of the elasticity of time that is encapsulated within the space. Awai had known about the site through the stories she had heard in her youth from Amerindian folklore of a time predating colonial contact and slavery and forced migration. This myth or origin story speaks of a tribe that killed and consumed hummingbirds during their victory celebration over another tribe, and that the gods were angered by this as the birds were sacred, and they in turn consumed the village overnight and thus became the pitch lake. Awai is interested in these stories that found a belief or world order that communities and individuals can hold on to at a particular time and context. She, um, these are things that can be thought of sacred or become a frame of a worldview so they can go forward in their existence and their sense and understanding of this world around them is formed. Awai notes that the pitch or tar lake is extracted as an important resource or commodity that is sold internationally from Trinidad and that the asphalt from this lake is known as the very best in the world, paving, for example, the roads that are in front of the White House or Buckingham Palace. Those who are working with this tar must always be on the move because it itself is moving and bubbling, consuming what is on it and also spitting it out. Thus, in an area of the lake, you may have an object churning about it from a day ago, but also from centuries ago all in the same spot. It becomes a surreal space where time is no longer linear. Her work reflects this oozing of mixed materials, including nail polish, which the artist notes is also important because of this idea of this chemical smell that the pitch gives off and this lingering scent and the impression of the materiality of the pitch in the space. The piece itself reflects on moments when folks were reconsidering monuments, both in the 1990s as well as more recently and that she passed by the Civil War Monument um, Memorial Arch known as the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Arch, which is located at the Grand Army Plaza in Brooklyn. and noticed a figure of a black man within the sculpture that she had not noticed before on her many journeys past this monument. Um, he's crouched right here. This image shows the sculptures of the Union Navy by Frederick McMoney's made in 1909 and that were added to the arch after it was uh, first originally made in 1889 to 92. Awai writes of the black soldier depicted in the sculpture here. He is never a victim. For me, he is, the tr the tr is, he is truly the alchemist, the person who transforms or creates through a seemingly magical process, who has the power to transform things for the better. She continues, 
We are truly in a state of flux of transformation, ecological, society, economic. The liquid land is simultaneously the site of demise and regeneration. The struggle for control of resources is ultimately the mining of our physical and psychological selves through eons of existence. History is always present and perpetual. The paradigm is shifting. The alchemist wields the power to adapt and to be malleable. As with all myths of creation and destruction, the liquid land continues to revolve and evolve with the signs and symbols, crescent moons and crosses of the alchemist incantations, manifesting the emergence of the morphing, transforming birds arriving from the source to propagate in the future. Awai offers what she notes as a creation myth. In her words, a mutated bird transforming in flight. For her, the figure in the work is calm, controlled resistance. What she notes as crouched, poised, and actively waiting, ready to make a well-calculated move. When she saw him, it was the spring of 2018 during the protests in the US. In this way, Awai was underlining the long history beyond the colonial histories of the site of Trinidad. And she's offering us a reimagining from within this atemporal space that is not only encompassing of past histories, but also generative of what might be possible for the future from this amalgam, including our destructive and traumatic pasts of colonial extractivism, reconstruction of the human to human, of the human to nature, what is possible, what this possible future can behold in terms of this alchemy, our new mythologies, and complete restructuring and re-understanding from the surreal magna, magma loosened from the holds of human time. I'd like to thank artists Catherine Chan and Nicola Y for their work and their conversations that they had for, with me for this presentation. Thank you. That was uh, really amazing. Uh, thank you so much, Alexandra. What a what a start. Um, um, the the transformation. I think that uh, we, at least I um, and all of us, I'm sure, see as um, the motor of uh, creativity in in emanating from the Caribbean. Uh, we saw that in, in uh, the way these two artists um, um, affect this alchemy, to use a word, uh, from, from the second um, set of works you considered. Um, an alchemy that really leads us to reimagining, indeed, um, the future, the past, all swirls into this matrix uh, of, um, of transformation. And uh, to, to recall Glisson himself, the memory of the future, you know, is really signaled um, in the way um, your artists, um, you know, sort of deal with their materials and, and the politics um, therein. So I think we are um, ready to move to um, the second um, the second uh, presentation today, uh, of course, we will revert to all our presenters when we bring them together um, at the end of each presentation to have a discussion with all of them. But for the moment, uh, we move uh, with uh, Li Xie uh, to the work of a Cuban uh, Chinese artist, Maria Magdalena Campos Pons. Uh, Li is a PhD candidate in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at New York University, and she holds a BA in Spanish. Um, um, and journalism from New York University. Um, and her PhD uh, research is at the intersections of diaspora studies and feminist aesthetics. Uh, her dissertation considers how Chinese diasporas are remembered um, in um, uh, contemporary feminist aesthetic practices in Latin America and the Caribbean. So uh, Lee, uh, Lizia is going to uh, talk to us about building precarious bridges Worlding the Caribbean as a decolonial remembering in the performances of Maria Magdalena Campos Pons. Over to you, Lee. I propose myself as a taking. I am to give away myself. I come to you with the energy of my ancestor, with my history, with the gift of the past to the present to the future. These words come from Maria Magdalena Campos Pons' performance, Regalos, which premiered at the Indianapolis Museum of Art in 2007 as part of the opening of Everything is Separated by Water, the first full-scale survey of the artist's oeuvre. Campos Pons, born 1959 in Matanzas, Cuba, has been active in the international art world since the mid-80s. With a broad artistic production that spans photography, painting, mixed media installations, film, video, and performance. Her intimate work explores 
her diasporic identity as an Afro-Cuban woman living in the United States since the 90s. With enslaved and indentured Nigerian and Chinese descendants who arrived to Cuba in the 19th century. Here, I consider her artistic proposition of telling the stories of the forgotten with her artistic practice, which moves past narrative expression in and through performance and acts of doing that reconfigure the materiality of hegemonic spaces like the museum and the relationships between actors and spectators within them. I discussed the regalos with the performances Yego Fefa and 53 plus one equals 54 plus one equals 55, the letter of the year, to trace the development of the artist's per performance persona and the stakes at play in placing her own body in the performance space. In their liveness, these performances generate encounters and build bridges based upon historical memory, cultural dialogue and festivity with the public. Besides the recovery of Afro-Asian legacies in the Caribbean, I suggest that Campos Ponce's performances offer us worlding in the full sense of the verbal noun as an unfinished action of repair that is a participatory and relational exercise. In the Regalos, the performative act of gift giving becomes the mode by which Campos Ponce counteracts the violences of history with the potential for healing. The artist enters the museum covered in small pouches containing drawings and messages made by her own hands. By wearing her gifts, proposing herself as a taking, Campos Pons transmits her history as a gift of the past to audience members in the present. Significantly, the act of taking in the performance does not fall into the violence of plunder. From the first instance, Campos Pons institutes clear conventions on the process. She is the one who invites the audience member to receive a gift, pointing and giving the instruction, you, come to me. Once called, the audience member rises and approaches Campbell's pawns. They receive the signal, take the bounty, must carefully remove a pouch attached to Campbell's pawns' dress, and then receives a thank you from the artist to seal the exchange, often replying with a gesture or oral affirmation of gratitude themselves. The process repeats itself with some variation. When all the gifts on her dress are taken, Campos Pons lowers the boat that she previously held above her head and enlists the help of a father and daughter to distribute the remaining gifts from the boat. The girl holds out a gift to a man in a wheelchair, but he does not accept, so she moves on to give it to someone else. Gift receiving is not mandatory. Only those who wish to participate are brought into the fold. As the narrative voiceover that accompanies the beginning of the performance suggests, I quote, the artist's body constructs a bridge, a memory line that conducts information to the audience. It is a gift, a gesture of proximity between the artist's persona and you, end quote. The bridge that Campos Pons constructs in Regalos is raised over water and specifically brings forth the Caribbean Sea as imaginary and as Derek Walcott wrote as history. But while the exhibition title, Everything is Separated by Water, evokes water as a space in which entangled histories of migration and displacement, whether born from colonialism or diaspora collide, Campos Pons' engagement with water is ultimately poetic. Water can separate, but it can also bring together through shared knowledge and relation. Edward Glisson gestured us towards this possibility when he said that, I quote, this experience of the abyss can now be said to be the best element of exchange, end quote. In Regalos, aquatic sounds intermingle with a live band in the background and mediate the opening of another temporary passage, which Campos Pons traverses with her audience in the time of the now. Their boat is, as Glisson argued, open, I quote. At the bow, there is still something we now share, this murmur, cloud or rain or peaceful smoke, we know ourselves as part and as crowd in an unknown that does not terrify, end quote. The gift that Campos Pons' performances give is this bounty of being together momentarily as a crowd and sharing with each other the plethora of what the narrative voice and the performance elucidates as the gift of the embrace, of negotiating, the gift of pardon, the gift to remember, the gift to forgive, among others. When Campos Pons exits the gallery with the words, now I invite you to open your bounty and share with everyone. She leaves the future of the performance to the spect actors.
In Regalos, Campos Pons returns to the primary scene of rupture from Africa for the enslaved subject. The moment Horton Spillers describes of Africans in Middle Passage as being, I quote, literally suspended in the oceanic, end quote. And Campos Pons's proposal of herself as a taking is the laceration of a hieroglyphics of the flesh that burns with the reminder of slavery's objectification of the black female body. That which Spillers argues, I quote, locates precisely a moment of converging political and social vectors that mark the flesh as a prime commodity of exchange, end quote. Campos Pons pro proposes herself as a taking, but in a converse move, she is the one to give away herself. She inhabits the captive female body in a way that Kimberly Juanita Brown explores as I quote, the contemporary black Atlantic attempt to reclaim the flesh through the same eternal body already burdened with slavery's legacy, end quote. By choosing to give away herself, Campos Pons contends with a lack of agency in a political body by controlling it in a generous way. She reworks the politics and violence of the scene borne by the economy of slavery by working through gifting as a relational economy with a set of connective logics. Campos Pons's performance persona, Fefa, first emerged during the 2012 Havana Biennale in the performance Ego Fefa, Fefa Arrived, which served as an antecedent to one of Campos Pons's most well known performances. 53 plus 1 equals 54 plus 1 equals 55, the letter of the year. FEFA's namesake, which stands for and appeals to familiares en el extranjero, FE, and family abroad, FA, marked a growing interest in Campos Pons's work in weaving connections between Cubans on and away from the island and contending with her own diasporic identity. In both Diego Fefa and the Letter of the Year, Fefa accomplishes brief familial unity in performances that build bridges between artists and spectators through the creation of festive environments. The performance of the Letter of the Year occurred in the 2013 Venice Biennale during the opening of the Cuban Pavilion, that year entitled The Perversion of Classics, The Anarchy of Narrations. We could say that Campos Pons performed this title when she appeared unannounced in Piazza San Marco and staged a daring guerrilla performance as Fefa, accompanied by members of the Afro-Cuban folkloric jazz group, Los Hermanos Arango. In the performance, Fefa surfaces caked in whiteface traditional among the Yoruba, dressed in a costume combining Chinese, Spanish, and Afro-Caribbean stylistic elements and wearing a birdcage crown. The Letter of the Year is a performance in which Campos Pons addresses more directly her Chinese ancestry. She brings to stark visibility a Chineseness whose cultural presence has often been collapsed in conceptions of Caribbean identity. In opposition to an orientalized representation which would render Chineseness transparent, Fefa is formed as an assemblage of cultures resistant to translation. Like her name and how she is assembled together in this multi-panel Polaroid collage, a technique that is a hallmark of Campos Pons's photographic work, she is composed in the territorial and syncretic cuts of diasporic blackness. Visually, Fefa challenges us to see across the colonial partition of African and Asian histories in the Caribbean. Inscribed in her body is a retracing of the Middle Passage to the Americas and the West Indies as what Wilson Harris suggested as bearing, I quote, the stamp of the spider metamorphosis and the refugee flying from Europe or in the indentured East Indian and Chinese from Asia, end quote. Born in La Vega, a sugar plantation town in the province of Matanzas, Campos Pons and her family history speak to the entanglement of Afro-Asian histories that intersect on the sugar plantation. Her Nigerian ancestors were brought to Cuba as slaves in the 19th century, and the Chinese side of her family worked as indentured servants in sugar mills. As mother and healer, Fefa and Campos Pons take on the labor of recovering these histories as reparative acts. Behind the grid lines that make up the Polaroid collage's composition is the indexical trace of love left from the artist's hands that hold them and piece Fefa together. A love that Derek Walcott in his off-sighted Nobel lecture in 1992 described as, I quote, a love that reassembles our African and Asiatic fragments, the cracked heirlooms whose restoration shows its white scars. 
This gathering of broken pieces is the care and pain of the Antilles. Antillean art is this restoration of our shattered histories, end quote. Worlding as it manifests in Campos Ponza's practice is driven by this impetus of repair. This same desire animates Campos Ponza and Fefa as they seek to weave connections between the Cuban diaspora today. Campos Pons has ascribed Fefa as both an artistic persona and a metaphor for the immigration, exile, family, and community separation experienced by numerous Cuban families. For the installation component of the letter of the year, housed within the Cuban pavilion, Campos Pons and her frequent collaborator and former partner, Neil Leonard, created a massive structure of bird cages housing multimedia players showing videos of interviews with Cuban residents on the island talking about their family members who had left the country. The layering of the voices of the interviewees was mixed with a recording of Cuban street criers, known as pregoneros, who have developed distinctive melodic and humorous cries incorporating African rhythms. Feva's appearance in Venice, with balls of fabric at her feet and placed delicately within the wicker bird cages left to unravel, was also an invitation to trace routes and bridge intersections, faithful to the dice work subject's rhizomatic errantry. The auditory experience of the multimedia installation and performance created a transnational soundscape of the Cuban diaspora and its world echoes. As the artist shared in a recent talk, I quote, my desire is connections, replenishments, end quote. For Campos Pons reckoning with the crossings that make up her own identity and moving from personal narrative to collective memory is finding balance in being many in one. It is, in the artist's words, finding justice. I call Campos Pons' body transformative, not only because of how it is spectacularized in her performances, or what it brings to bear on institutional spaces as a gendered and raced body holding the legacies of colonialism, but because of what it does in the performance space, which is following Octavio Zaya, to use acts of doing to reestablish connections in order to encounter a new way of imagining the world. The rendering of history that Campos Ponce's performances give us is a decolonial remembering akin to how Wilson Harris spoke of a third space in which exists, I quote, perspectives of renaissance which can bring into play a figurative meaning beyond an apparently real world or prison of history, end quote. It is not a retrieval of the past as it was, but rather its reassembly in the present and its future liberatory potentials. It is a world making that happens in the liveness of performance and the encounters it generates, and the political potentials of being together, what Nicholas Boria describes in artwork as a social interstice, as that space upon which social exchanges other than those that prevail are practiced and new bonds are forged. The bridges Campbell's Ponce's performances build are made possible by the human connection enabled by art. Worlding as it is worked through in these performances is also a gesture in the glissantian sense of giving on and with that opens finally on totality, in Glissant's words, open to the radiance that he saw in an, I quote, opacity of the diverse, animating the imagined transparency of relation, end quote. These bridges, while generous in nature and sustained by care, are by nature precarious. The encounters they generate are not always stable, since they are conditioned by the differences in our own positions and the contingency and singularity of the relational event. Campos Pons may construct situations that involve the participation of the audience, but the transition of the spectator to spect actor is never guaranteed. At the same time, the artist may appeal to relationality, but never in a way that would ally the histories of violence that condition the event of encounter. Ultimately, Campos Pons' bridge, bridges may only hold for an instant, not because they are weak, but because they will always be a work in progress. What a, what a gift, what a regalo that paper itself was. Thank you, um, Elise, for that um, a moving, um, a moving um, exploration of uh, Campus Ponce's work. Um, and also, I think, um, really taking us to the um, heart of um, um, the counter economy, shall we say, um, 
of, of the gift, <laughs> not the economy of the gift, because it is really about a different kind of an exchange, isn't it, that we are, um, uh, that, that, that these performances activate the memory of. Um, I also really appreciated uh, the dialogue with uh, the great Caribbean um, writers, uh, Wilson Harris and Derek Walcott. And indeed, uh, the whole paper made me remember uh, another Caribbean um, uh, voice um, from Cuba, Nicolas Guillén. And he has this little uh, poem, uh, Un son para niños antianos, a son for um, Antillean children, which is about a paper um, boat. Um, it really reminded me of that. Maybe you know about that poem. Um, but um, we carry on um, in this um, on this theme really of transformations, unexpected and surprising transformations, which uh, is uh, the uh, modus operandi, if you like, of the Caribbean itself through this idea of creolization. And uh, that is indeed what uh, we will get in our third uh, presentation um, by Alpesh Kantilal Patel. Uh, he is an associate professor of contemporary art at Temple University in the USA and uh, is the author of uh, Productive Failure, Writing Queer Transnational South Asian Art Histories. Um, Alpesh's uh, talk today uh, is titled Transregional Engagements, Sexual Artistic Geographies, and it will take us to both Haiti and Poland. Over to you, Alpesh. Hi, everyone. The, uh, the text that you see on the slide right now, uh, Transregional Entanglements, Sexual Artistic Geographies, that is the provisional title of a book project that I'm working on that it, it attempts to bring together the conversation um, artists uh, who have works dealing with sexu sexuality from different parts of the globe. And, you know, to begin to, to put this together, I realized I needed different frames than um, uh, what I had at hand to be able to kind of um, accomplish this goal of, of colliding and, and, and bringing together these disparate uh, sort of conversations. And Edward Glissant's uh, theories on creolization became really um, important, right? His ideas of cultural mixings in the Caribbean that come as a result of slavery and plantation culture and colonialism. You know, he believed this idea of creolization uh, from the Caribbean could actually um, uh, work outside of it. And uh, that's sort of the camp that I'm in. Um, there is controversy about whether or not that uh, would make sense or not. Stuart Hall, for instance, um, doesn't know if, if it would make sense to be looking at creolization outside. But I'm, I'm a big believer that, that it can. And a lot of these concepts that, that you see on the slide right now are those of Glissant, and they are so rich and poetic and became really useful as sort of headings of units um, uh, in my book. And today I'm going to talk about uh, the work of one artist, uh, Jacek Koloszynski, uh, in particular of the, his work, The Creole Archive from the 2015 to present, to kind of animate some of these points uh, that I'm, I'm bringing up. So uh, Jacek is based in Miami and uh, it, his work was inspired by visits to Little Haiti, an area of Miami that's so named for its many Haitian refugees of the 1980s who settled there. Uh, the area also includes many restaurants, cultural centers, uh, et cetera. Uh, and Kolshinsky's Creole Archive does the important work, I say, of making a very queer and creolizing connection between Haiti, Poland, the United States, and parts of Africa. And in this way does um, what uh, um, Erol Gustav talks about, uh, of, of thinking about the nation as a singular route that reaches out to, to other roots. Um, so not sort of a stable phenomenon. Another way of thinking about this is uh, to invoke his ideas of multiple and one that um, he comes across by looking at the archipelago, that there are islands that are singular uh, uh, and at the same time, they're connected to the multiple, um, the other islands of the archipelago. So this idea of the multiple and one kind of um, uh, existing at the same time became uh, very important. So during his visits, uh, sort of in Miami, he would see many depictions of the Haitian voodoo spirit, Azili, and that, there's a depiction of Azili on, on the left. And it resembled the doleful black Madonna of Chestakova, and uh, that there's the image of that on, on the right. Uh, the uh, Madonna of Chestakova is a four foot high religious icon of the Virgin Mary. 
And he was quite familiar with this having grown up in Poland in the 70s and um, 80s. So both Azili and the Black Madonna have darker skin and two slashes on her cheek. And the similarity between them isn't accidental. And Kolchinsky was aware of this. The, the transnational materialization of the Black Madonna as Azili uh, in Haiti can be traced back to the presence of Poles in Haiti in the late 18th century and early 19th century. Uh, and the movement of the Madonna from Poland to Haiti and indeed to Miami maps almost exactly Kolosinski's own shift from Krakow, Poland, which he left soon after Soviet rule ended to Miami where he has now lived for more than um, a decade. Uh, the story of the, the Black Madonna is a complex one um, and I'm sort of gonna re reduce it uh, in particular to the, uh, the, the movement of, of Polish Poles under Napoleon uh, to Haiti. They were conscripted to um, uh, quell the rebellion that was taking place uh, by uh, uh, Trosson Overture at the time. But the Poles actually felt much more sympathetic to um, the, um, the Haitians than they did uh, actually um, Napoleon and his troops. So they ended up fighting alongside um, the Haitians. So when um, Haiti, um, you know, actually did uh, sort of uh, you know, they were successful. The only slave rebellion that is successful that we know of, uh, they allowed a certain number of Poles and also uh, Germans to, to live in Haiti. And there are still a number of people that they trace their genealogy to these Poles. So this, you know, this materialization of the Black Madonna can be connected to this uh, one specific moment where Poland and Haiti um, were interlocked, as you could say. And this is all backstory to kind of bring in this archive that Kolosinski uh, really beautifully puts together. The archive for him um, is a way to kind of bring together fictional evidence that would allow us to very easily see the connections between Haiti, uh, uh, ha uh, Poland, and indeed other places in the United States and Africa as well. One of the ways he does this is he uh, 3D prints the Madonna. Some of them are, um, you know, the size of, of, of an object that you could put in the palm of your hand and others are about two feet in, in high. There's sort of a multiplicity of them. Um, they're kind of unending and uh, he continues to sort of um, make these, these objects. Uh, and, you know, they're sort of exemplary of the seemingly interminal subjectivities through which Azili queers uh, fixed categorical meaning. Uh, Almasuki Tinsley has suggests that when she refers to Azili, um, uh, she refers to her as a sort of a manly black superwoman, a beautiful femme queen, a bull dyke, a weeping willow, and a dagger mistress, among other names. So um, she goes by many different names. And in Haiti in particular, uh, she has become sort of um, a favorite of the LGBT community. community. She's a, a, a sort of protectress, protectress of that community. Just going to walk through some of these really interesting uh, 3D prints that he's made, and what you're going to you know notice right away is there is a lot of bold use of color or bold bold use here of sort of, sort of gold, and the faces um, are obscured as well. Uh, and I, I want to connect that kind of use of color and the obscuring of the faces to Glissant's notions of opacity. So Glissant's known as saying that if we're gonna have this sort of interconnected world, um, that it can only happen if every citizen um, of the planet is, has this right to opacity. That is to say, not reveal um, everything. Uh, you know, and this is in contradic contradistinction to the West that um, uh, we're to be transparent, right? And to continually provide information um, about ourselves. Uh, so th th this kind of bright use of color, I feel, actually sort of prevents this access into the interior of the Madonna. It's, it's so sort of bright and gaudy um, that uh, we're not able to penetrate the Madonna, allowing sort of this possibility of opacity to, to kind of emerge. And the same with these sort of obscured uh, faces. Um, she already sort of had, you know, darker skin, and that darker skin is connected to um, uh, a fire that took place originally in, in Poland. That's one story why she has the darker skin. But here he's you know, completely sort of removed um, uh, the image of the, of the face. And uh, I wanna kind of link that again to this notion of opacity. So he has a number of these different Madonnas that he shows. 
I, I wanted to kind of focus in on this particular one uh, because you can see sort of the threads that are coming out of it. Uh, and normally he would have cut these off, but he's included this as a kind of complete object uh, in the archive. I, I mean, I'm really interested in it because it really brings up the idea that, um, you know, he's using plastic to create these Madonnas. And the plastic is made of sugar and corn. And in this way, it sort of obliquely references Haitian um, plantation culture. Haiti was fr France's wealthiest colony because of its sugar production. And the physical process of printing its cultures requires an incredible amount of heat. And that recalls the dangerous process of refining the sugar of the new world. So there's this really nice connection between the materials that Kolchinsky is using and these metaphors that he's also sort of invoking. So in addition to these sort of 3D printed Madonnas, he has this sort of ever-growing um, uh, number of cards uh, onto which he has sort of fixed different emblems or has Polaroid um, images of, of a variety of different images that I'll show you that are connected to these disparate regions that, that I've mentioned. They resemble sort of what we might think of what might be um, you know, typical for an archive in that there are sort of stamps legitimizing um, uh, the card. At the bottom of the card, as you see here, there's all this information about what the object is. It is numbered, so each of these cards has a number. Uh, so the, the objects that I'm showing you now, what he calls archival elements, are uh, it's a, this is like a postcard from Poland that he's affixed here. Uh, these are sort of cuttings from um, a postcard from Poland. These are prayer cards, emblems. Uh, so all these connect to, to the kind of Polish side of the story. Uh, this is the more historical angle, but there's a contemporary aspect too. I mentioned that Azili, um, you know, um, is, is this sort of, a, it's a protectress of the LGBTQ community in Haiti. Well, more recently, um, she's become this icon in Poland as well. Uh, which is a kind of interesting turn. So this particular um, piece that you see here is in homage um, to the more recent kind of use of um, the Madonna of Chestakova um, as a queer icon. So he uses Polaroids, which I think is a kind of fascinating, um, uh, you know, um, medium through which to kind of bring together these archives. Here he's taken images or stills of a, a documentary on sort of the Pope, um, the Polish uh, soldiers that I sort of briefly mentioned earlier that would have gone to, uh, gone to Haiti. Uh, this documentary presents these um, uh, legionnaires as really particularly violent and uh, excessive in their use of force. Uh, and so, so politics, he takes these you know, Polaroids, he's sort of warping the document, you could say, and calling attention to the fact that this documentary is, you know, one version of maybe a story, maybe not the, the, the only story. Uh, the Polaroid also just references his own sort of use of it in the 80s um, in Poland too. You're looking at, at the, you know, sort of a number of cards now that kind of take us more into, into Haiti. Uh, the, the left, we have a image of, um, uh, Lavatour, the slave who rose through the ranks to eventually lead the rebellion in Haiti. In the middle, you have a mixed race Polish prince who fought for Napoleon. He's included uh, tourist postcards that are uh, problematic, uh, and he's sort of thrown this into the mix uh, as, as well. These are sort of doodlings that he's done. Uh, of the Azili figure in, in Haiti, uh, the Veve marking that's there. Uh, he's included, you know, snapshots, uh, photographs that he took in Haiti when he went after the 2010 earthquake there. He was a, a volunteer. So he makes this archive personal um, and makes it also very clear by doing that, that it is incredibly subjective. There's nothing objective about um, any of what he's doing. Um, I think it's very, it's great that he brings himself into uh, the conversation uh, of the archive. I mentioned earlier that, you know, you know in addition to Poland and Haiti, uh, other parts of the world are kind of brought into this archive. These are um, ancient prints of uh, slave quarters in Louisiana. 
Uh, and, and during the early 19th century, amid the Haitian Revolution, many whites and free people of color from Saint Domingue um, arrived with their slaves in Louisiana in their in the United States, doubling the population of New Orleans. So he's making this connection uh, to Louisiana and the slavery that was there. But at the same time, he also sort of invokes Africa. And I'm going back to the sort of Madonna figures. These are very interesting because they're not very bold and colorful. Um, he's applied this liquid rubber. Uh, that's very non-reflective um, uh, and he uses this charcoal like very gray black um, color as well. But these literal entanglements that you're, you're looking at here is a reference to the um, boccio objects that the Fawn people um, in present day Benin used. Uh, they were meant to sort of be reflections of pain and anguish connected to states um, issues slavery as well as a means of redressing wrongs and dis um, dissipating attendant anxiety as art historian Suzanne Blyer notes. Uh, what's you know, interesting here is of course that the Fawn tribe brought voodoo to Haiti. In fact, the word um, voodoo is, a trans, uh, is transculturated from the Fawn kingdom. So he brings in all these really interesting strands. There's per, um, peripheral figures as well, uh, like this guy, uh, Faustin Verkus, a Polish American soldier stationed in Haiti um, during the US occupation uh, there. and who became the white king of Laganov. And, and there's a whole backstory here that um, actually uh, Kolchinsky is animating right now um, at an, in an exhibition in Oronsko in Poland. These are images of the botanicals in Miami, buttons that he's produced that circulate. And I'll sort of end with this image uh, that, uh, you know, is connected to him going to Poland and projecting um, these sort of botanical uh, images of Azili in Miami onto the structures of buildings there. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it's very striking to see the absorption, right, of this image into the architecture of, of Poland and making it incredibly clear how entangled um, these particular um, uh, countries, um, Haiti, Miami, et cetera, um, are you know ironic because of the very xenophobic nature more recently uh, of Poland uh, as well. Here's some more projections uh, that are very interesting to look at. They're uh, they're incorporated into um, the archive in the cards, and uh, you know I'll finally just end with the idea that this particular case study um, you know really brings into into for the idea that the Caribbean is is something that we can't see as a fixed geography, that it, it is connected to other nations and, and therefore Glissant's ideas maybe make a lot of sense to, to bring in. But other chapters in my uh, book don't um, actually um, uh, reference the Caribbean and the entanglements are ones that, that I'm creating as well. So I'll stop there and uh, I look forward to talking more about this and also about the other presentations. Thank you very much. Another um, extremely fruitful um, dialogic presentation there. Um, thank you so much, uh, Alpesh. Um, I think uh, the paper really strongly reminded us that as you end by saying, um, the relationality in the Caribbean must include um, a, you know, re-interrogation of um, the place of Europe within, um, within our imaginings of what Caribbeanness is and does. Um, and here, of course, um, the, the Creole archive of Kolajinsky is, is just uh, so appropriate uh, to launch that um, and the vibrant and, um, you know, even productively dangerous um, figure of Ezeli Danto, uh, you know, showing us the way. Um, obviously, um, uh, dialoguing with queer theory there, bringing creolization to talk to queer theory, um, uh, I think is the way, one of the ways in which we can um, take relationality away from binaristic um, modes of um, thinking of um, how spaces can, uh, can be positioned vis-a-vis -vis each other. Um, and um, on that note, then, let us move to another space, which is indeed um, uh, impossible to avoid, perhaps, in thinking about uh, a worlding of the Caribbean. And that is um, the other ocean. Um, 
one of the other oceans <laughs> that we should go to, um, the Indian Ocean. So with the uh, final um, presentation, uh, we move there. Um, this is um, a joint presentation by Nidhi Mahajan, who is a cultural anthropologist uh, focusing on political economy, sovereignty, maritime trade, and mobility in the Indian Ocean. And uh, Nidhi is assistant professor of anthropology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She's also the inaugural Fatima Mernesi postdoctoral fellow at the Africa Institute at Sharjah, which is a new and exciting space for all of us. Uh, we are all very excited to know what's going to come out of there. And Nidhi, you're well positioned to, 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 to obviously indicate to us a bit of, of, of the work of this new institute. With Nidhi presenting with her is uh, Moad uh, Musbahi, who is an independent researcher and artist um, researching um, uh, migration as a cultural practice and forms of knowledge production. Um, so um, Nidhi and Moad are going to talk to us about objects of abeyance, objects of abeyance on relationality and being in Indian Ocean worlds. Over to the two of you. At 3 a.m. on the 20th of May, a low pressure area formed over the Southeast region of the Arabian Sea. It was predicted to weaken after 24 hours, but in fact continued to intensify over the next three days, where it finally gained its peak intensity on May 25th, passing east of the Yemeni island of Sokotra, making landfall on Oman on that same day. Although the cyclone was being monitored closely by meteorologists and sailors on weather apps such as Stormwatch and Windy.com, its effects were deathly and unpredictable. After all, it was the most intense tropical cyclone to hit the Arabian Peninsula in recorded history. This was known as the extremely severe cyclone storm, Cyclone Mikunu. Though the numerical weather prediction evolved dynamically over these hours before the storm finally dissipated, its movement and consequences during its passage over the sea and the ensuing heavy rainstorms and locust outbreak that affected regions as far out as Pakistan were not as legible from the scientific model. These fears of an unknown environment exacerbated with, camp, with climate change. Sailors commonly talk about how weather patterns were more predictable and less treacherous in the past. The monsoon now begun, begins a month later than it once did, they say matter of factly. However, the, wor the worry is not so much a delayed but still predictable monsoon, but the frequent occurrences of unpredictable cyclones and a more turbulent ocean. The waves are much higher now and wind stronger, elderly sailors would remark. The Indian Ocean, the fastest warming ocean, has seen rising sea levels and increasing frequency of tropical cyclones and other adverse weather events. This condition has followed the same timeline in which the environment itself has also become ever more numerical. Yet for those that inhabit it, nature, the environment, land and sea are all not just backdrops in this computation of life, but at the very center of it. Being in ocean worlds is to prioritize the location of knowledge production. If, as Sylvia Winter argues, the central struggle today is between the overrepresented European man versus a more capacious understanding of the human, we ask what might such a different understanding look like? Winter's argument, and one that strongly resonates, resonates with the ocean worlds that we will explore, points to the crucial simultaneity of humans as biological, cultural, and alterable. After all, as she says, we come into being by languaging existence. We follow Catherine McKittrick's claim to take seriously from where we know knowledge in opposition to what we already may know, a framework in which the connective and relational sit in contrast to the normative hierarchy in which science is prior to social constriction. But if to paraphrase Aung San Ho, the imperial view is a view from one kind of boat, and there are other boats as well. What does it mean to understand the human from a different perspective that does not center European or even Atlantic modes of being? Rather than grounding ourselves in European epistemologies and binaries of man, human, nature, culture, and even land, ocean, today we chart a different kind of being, a conception rooted in Sufi Islamic theology, and one that is lived by sailors who move across the Indian Ocean today. The Indian Ocean has long provided a counterpoint to Eurocentric histories of interconnection and universalism. For centuries prior to colonial expansion, this ocean, the wooden vessels and dows that connected different parts of South and Southeast Asia, Africa and Middle East moved goods, people and ideas across 
a huge and vast space. Here, the ocean is a space of connection and produces a relationality that exists prior to and can use, continues to disturb European dominance. What would it mean to reimagine the human in this oceanic well? In what follows, we try and chart and we think through the Indian Ocean and the boats and dows that traverse it to reimagine and rearticulate re a form of being and relationality that emerges from this context. One that is grounded in Sufi theology and throws up a different axis on which to think about the human and being. It is a theology that takes the ocean as a concept from which to think about wilding, about life and non-living, and more directly thinking through the concept of wahdat al-wujud, or the unity of life, which is drawn from the writings of the 13th century Sufi scholar Ibn Arabi. Being is the sea, speech is the shore, the shells are letters, the pearls of knowledge of the heart. In every wave it casts up a thousand royal pearls, of traditions and holy sayings and texts. Every moment a thousand waves rise out of it, yet it never becomes less by one drop. This is a quote from Mahmud Sebastari, a Persian poet from the 13th century. The ocean as a body of water and as a body of knowledge takes a series of different crucial conceptual and literal forms. As a dynamic space of constant differentiation and a relational space that exceeds singular comprehension, it has featured prominently in Sufi theology as a space of constant becoming. Wooden sailing vessels known as dows or in Kachi as vahans have long traversed the littoral using a sail and moving with the monsoon winds. Today, these vahan are mechanized and can fly in the face of the winds. But for the sailors whose lives are held in abeyance as they traverse turbulent Indian Ocean waters on board these dows, their forms of movement, rhythms of labor, and tools of navigation are all bound up with the Sufi conception of Wuhadat al wujud where the force of non-living things like corpses, shrines, and flags is channeled into the living and vice versa, as historian Wilson Chaco Jacob has understood it. Life and being here is open, permanent, and perpetually unfolding, past, present, and future, the living and non-living imploding unto each other. In this way, the weather, its past, pervasive present, and future forms becomes a text for sailors as they read it beyond the singular climatic event. History itself cast as a collection of meteorological and saintly events. And at times, these things are one and the same. Take, for example, the origin myth of the town of Jam Salaya, a port town on the Gulf of Kutch that many of these Dao sailors now call home. It is said that when the town was first settled, the original inhabitants, sailors of the Badala caste, were shocked to find that every year with the monsoon rains, their houses would float out to sea. It is only with the arrival of a Sufi saint, Masum Shah, that the waters no longer flooded their homes. Today, a shrine or dargah of the saint sits by the shore, continuing to mark the boundary between land and sea, becoming a place of pilgrimage before and after every voyage. For Tao sailors then, the living and non-living, nature, culture, land and sea, implode unto each other, becoming the unity of being, or Wahadat al-Wujud. So yet for these sailors, it is with the Tao that life ends and begins and ends again. As one retired sailor narrated, when the world ends, all that will be left is the Tao. After all, what was Noah's Ark? The Tao, made of wood, flexible, and easily improvised, connects the saintly, the climatic, and even the economic. Yet, when every Tao is built, it is blessed by an imam, and every year offerings are made to Dariyapir, the saint of the sea, to ensure the safety of the vessel and those on board. The Tao's possibility, um, formally as a boat and legally as a method of shipping, exists in the strategic nexus of a series of parameters. In a practical sense, the use of wood means that the way in which it is loaded becomes more forgiving. Large shipping vessels made from welded steel require a precise distribution of weight to not be too heavy at the bow stern, whereas Tao's timber buoyancy means that such considerations need not be a matter of concern. Its method of construction is one that comes from the very place in which many of the families reside, the mangroves from the Gulf of Kutch, and which means that its repair becomes a product of a type of knowledge that is passed down along kin. It is of a particular size as being capable of carrying a capacity that is below international shipping regulations and thus allows it to skirt onerous rules. 
It also enables the captain to be able to be more savvy in taking ship route, shipping routes that are considered more treacherous and thus being able to respond and more, um, respond to the global commodity to be able to respond to global commodity price fluctuations more savvily and with more agility. Beyond the constraints around the import of goods that vary from port to port, two key measurements are considered. Firstly, that of the ship's cruise life insurance and in saintly, crucially and not financial terms, and the weight of the overall goods that are being carried. This latter measurement, called the dead weight tonnage, factors into the boat's maneuverability. It considers how strongly it is affected by the ocean's forces. If overloaded, the boat is more susceptible to the currents, rains, and waves, and thus is at greater risk. The marker upon the hull of each dial determines the level of water that is displacing and how heavy it has been loaded. It is a value that does not differ differentiate between the human and non-human and becomes the first matter of concern during disasters. In this conception, the Ind in the Indian Ocean, humans rely on reading the non-human to avert disaster. Even in the 17th century, Tao sailors read the environment to navigate. Before beginning a voyage, forecasts of the success of the voyage were made based on prevailing constellations and their impact. As historian Chaya Goswami has shown, these forecasts were made using hybrid Indo-Arab astrological methods, including the use of the Hindu Panchang Almanac that was consulted to predict the weather and before making big decisions, such as undertaking new business ventures and voyages. Astrology and astronomy thus played a key role in navigation. Tools of navigation, especially those that relied on reading a changing seascape, were also used to predict and guide the fortune of a voyage. For example, mid-voyage, the sighting of a snake-shaped fish known as Mareja were used to navigate. Other natural formations were also markers that were used in navigation, such as sea foam and cloud formations. More unconventional navigational aids included the use of tame birds, as well as sightings of birds on deck. The sightings of birds on deck indicated good or bad omens, even the, even the chirping of birds domesticated and brought on board, being used to predict fortunes and mitigate uncertainty. For instance, the chirping of birds or kakvani, such as the duck, could be interpreted as, whatever is lost will be recovered, so do not worry. Indeed, the saintly too played a significant role in ensuring the safe movement of a vessel. All ships have flags, the flag of the country they are registered in and the country whose waters they are in at the time. Dao's from India are also flagged in this way, but they also have another kind of flag, a flag that is placed prior to the flag of any nation state. This is the flag of a patron Sufi saint. This flag goes not only where other flags go, visible to patrollers on top of the cabin, but instead are also placed on the bow of the vessel, as if to say, lead the way. While the nation state flag of a ship keeps changing, the flag of the Sufi saint is unwavering and marks a different notion of sovereignty, especially visible in times of danger. Take for example, the case of Irfan, a Dao captain. On May 25th, 2018, Irfan and his crew were anchored off the coast of Salala in Oman. They were closely following the movement of Cyclone Mikun. The cyclone had caused unprecedented destruction on the Yemeni port of Sakotra and was now heading their way. After securing the vessel, Irfan took out a small green flag and tied it to a banister near the cabin. The green fabric of the flag was cut from a sheet that had once covered the tomb, the body of Shah Murad Bukhari, patron saint of seafarers from Western India. The flag carried his blessings. When the cyclone hit Salala, seven other Daos capsized in the storm. Yet Irfan and his crew survived and continued their voyage to Yemen. Upon his return to India, Irfan made a pilgrimage to the Darga, a shrine of Shah Murad Bukhari, to thank him for his protection. For Irfan and his crew, the flag was not only an apatropaic object, but also marked the sovereignty of the saint, and indeed was drawn from the cloth that covered the body of the dead saint which was now harnessed to protect the living. The flag then is an object of abeyance, one that makes death, life, death possible. The songs and speeds of the monsoon world. Historically, work on board a Dao was backbreaking. Sailors often, using, often used song as a way to pace breath, to give strength and coordinate activity. 
these activities that required a group effort so that the breath of the multiple can, can be turned into one cohesive breath and give a singular rhythm to their labor. Today, some of these activities have been mechanized, but still rhythm and music are crucial for forms of collective understanding. Sailors who are bored at mechanized work often produce videos of their time at sea. These are often set to music. These songs are typically devotional ones and are intended to amplify the power of the saint toward against death, but also points to death as inevitability in which life unfolds within it, human and non-human imploding into an ocean of unity. So, for example, in this video taken by a sailor, which has a devotional song um, superimposed on it, the song actually seeks God protect God's protection and states that, you know, may the protection of God and the saints be with us as we traverse these uh, treacherous waters. So, quote, like a layer in which the movement of one string makes all others vibrate and thus evokes the secret harmonies of related concepts. This is a saying from Ibn Arabi in which he builds on a tradition where the self is but a word articulated by its creator. He defines this world that is composed by subjects of speech as speech and connected through speech. For he posits that this very world is structured in a way parallel to the structure of a poem. He says, all the world is endowed with rhythm fastened by rhyme on the straight path. Sound in this light becomes a common principle of exchange, a vital medium which makes possible the imagining of the universe as a whole in this view of Wahdat al-Wujud or the unity of life. The importance of the vocalic becomes a way of being in the world as a method to conceptualize this unity and its relationality. Sound connects what might first seem distant from it a voicing out against the seemingly static confines of the biocentric terms of man into a practice that defines sounding as fathoming, as a continuous listening to the constellation that engulfs us all. Objects of abeyance become tools that not only literally imagine the possibility of this oceanic world, but also become a mechanism to define it. They simultaneously evidence and produce a space that is constantly heard, spoken, narrated. They break down the social subordination to the scientific. They become a method from which to articulate what is at stake in the possibility of their erasure. And in their re-articulation, become one way to radically deny categories that are ultimately always singular, relational, and incessantly coming to be. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, um, we've come to uh, the end of four extremely um, rich, thought-provoking, and moving uh, presentations. Uh, the final one taking us um, to um, the space of the Western Indian Ocean, uh, but continuing through the very um, uh, you know uh, materiality of the boat, the Dao in this case. Um, th that uh, contact and connection and dialogue with the Caribbean, uh, the worlding, indeed, that uh, the panel um, hoped to, to, to bring to us. So what we're going to do now is um, invite everybody on uh, the screen. Um, so um, to all the participants, I invite you to uh, come and join me on the screen by switching on your audios and videos. And let's have a conversation about your work. Welcome everyone. So um, I think we're all here. Um, thank you again for, for those um, amazing uh, presentations. Um, what um, I'm gonna do is um, obviously take some questions, but the questions are building up. Um, on the side. So we've got uh, one at the moment, others are coming in, uh, but as we um, wait for them, 
um, I think we can warm up by having our own, um, you know, conversation between us. Um, and I certainly wanted to throw into the mix um, some key ideas that I um, drew out from, from all the four presentations and the five people we have here with us. Um, so um, I think uh, the, the biggest thing for me really was this idea of uh, um, not, uh, I mean, um, of, of, of the Caribbean worlding as bringing into, um, in drawing into that space of the Caribbean, um, Afro-Asian histories, uh, other oceans, uh, other continental spaces, um, you know, the relationship with with, with with Europe rethought perhaps in the frame of this new spotlight, we are all shining on how the Indian Ocean and the Pacific can be brought into conversation with um, the Atlantic via the Caribbean. Um, so for me, these, these transoceanic and I think therefore also in a way transcontinental um, discussions perhaps could be uh, something I'd like you all to talk a bit to. But apart from that, I mean, th that is just the frame, the geographic frame, if you like. I think what came out was this interesting um, convergence on, on, on certain almost philosophical, um, you know, um, issues, um, the idea of um, alternative epistemologies, um, ones that traffic in opacity, in uh, reinvention, transformation, particularly through the idea of alchemy, of, 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 of materials of low value into uh, poetic, performative, you know, and, and uh, artistic materials, but which goes back to the idea of trialization itself as, 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 the, as, as, as the mode of change. Um, spirituality, of course, the, the, the final paper, I think, um, the last two papers brought out the voodoo cosmogony and sufiology, as you, I think that was the word you used, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but um, the work of, uh, you know, um, the, the artists addressed in the two earlier papers, of course, have a dialogue with Caribbean forms of spirituality. So um, I'd, I'd love to, to hear a little bit more, I'm sure all of us would, from the, from the presenters on these issues. And um, I will invite you to perhaps uh, um, address some of these points I've raised, but indeed others that you found con uh, resonant between each other. And uh, we'll, we'll then take some questions by and by also as they come in. Um, Maybe we can we can start with uh, with Alexandra simply because you know it's nice to go back to the beginning as it were of the presentations and refresh ourselves um, as to what we heard first and then we'll go to the others. So maybe Alexandra, we could hear from you a bit. Yeah, um, yeah no, um, thank you so much. Um, all the presentations are really rich, um, and um, just I guess um, thinking about uh, you know. Um, I was thinking of Alpesh's uh, presentation and, the, and, and, and what you were saying as well um, in terms of um, bringing in Europe, because um, I know I didn't mention this, but um, Catherine Chan's work, I mean, I, I mentioned a little bit with her influence of, like, of um, Turner, as well as, you know, Leonardo da Vinci, in which we were talking a bit, but, um, but how within Trinidad, um, the group of artists she had mentioned that she was with, you know, traveling along the coast, um, but also um, meeting within, you know, um, the national park there and, you know, um, looking at the wildlife there. They, they were like a naturalist in a way, you know, uh, and really influenced actually by people that were coming into the space um, for um, conferences that were part of like National Geographic. So they, they were part of this conversation that was, you know, um, kind of this Western look at, um, you know, uh, stemming from, you know, the, uh, the whole Audubon, the history of, you know, um, like the century, uh, early in the century on. So, I mean, she has this interesting space that she's in, in which, you know, not only is she, you know, immersed within uh, uh, the, the mist that she talks about. And also, you know, of course, like these difficulties they're having to have, you know, um, fresh water, you know, all these different, you know, very complex uh, layers of um, legacies of um, where she is right now, but then also within this intermix of 
um, the, the narrative of nature within, you know, uh, kind of a colonial history of nature as well. So it, I just wanted to put that in there because it, it, it was, I thought that was interesting in terms of like, also thinking about uh, what you had mentioned about rethinking the framing of Europe and what that means um, to the works uh, or, or the, the subjects that we're talking about, so. That, that's really interesting. I just want to remind our audience members of which there are good 150, <laughs> please um, do send in uh, questions via the Q&A box because we have a very efficient way of, of making sure they reach us. So um, even if you're not directly looking at the Q&A box all the time. So, so please, um, we have um, a couple, but um, you know, let's just wait for some more to come. We can go on till quarter past the hour. So we, we have a bit of time. But Alexandra, that was a really um, interesting response again to this idea of um, some of the issues you were talking about already in the paper and then going and you know thinking about the role of, of, of certain kinds of travel, you know, um, in, in the post-colonial period as well, that brings, you know, different kinds of people back to the Caribbean, including the Euro Europeans. I mean, of course, this is a kind of the trajectory that Alpesh, um, uh, you, were, you were tracing through the work of uh, Jacek uh, Kolajinski. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that in response to maybe what Alexandra said? Yeah, I mean, what I, what I um, thought was really great about Alexandra said, uh, I feel very much like a lot of what we're doing here is trying to think of um, new ways of thinking that we actually need to be able to assess um, artists work that um, have been seen as maybe not important or don't really fit into a different framework. So, I mean, one of the things with, with, um, with the Austic work, uh, you know, how does it work when it's uh, exhibited in Miami versus um, Oransko in Poland versus, Haiti, these, these locations themselves uh, with their rich histories, I think um, really bring out very specific histories in the work. And, that, and that's something that the white cube, you know, in a way um, ignores, right? Everything outside of the walls is somehow not important, but um, uh, these works really demand um, us to think about geography, nationality, um, transnationality in some ways. I'm going to be a little um, provocative here, Alpesh, if I may, um, because one of the things that um, I, I found uh, as an Indian person working on the Caribbean uh, was people constantly, well, working on both the Caribbean and then when I was going to places like Mauritius, people just assume that I must, well, not people in Mauritius knew I wasn't from Mauritius or people in Trinidad knew I wasn't from Trinidad, but somehow other people would sort of impure. So are you from somewhere else, which is like us, you know? And I'd be like, no, I'm from India. So, you know, there's often the sense as to how can um, some of us who are not, not from the Caribbean, you know, how do we relate uh, to, I mean, it's a question of relationality. It's not even if you're not from Caribbean, you're neither Polish nor, you know, Haitian. How does one relate to that? So does relationality itself offer us a way to rethink our position and location as researchers and free up, but mm -hmm. also challenge certain, you know, uh, both, um, both a, a, a warning and a provocation, if you like, about the limits and possibilities of relationality vis-a-vis -vis our own positions. Um, I think that's a question that all of us could fruitfully answer. Not we won't just keep <laughs> Alpesh on the dock there, but you know, it's it, it's your paper that made me think about it. Um, uh, if if um, maybe you could just start us off, and then I'd love the others to to to, to come in on that too. Um. And I, I, I love how you put that, the sort of possibility and the danger of, of, of this kind of thinking. And, uh, and, and that's something as researchers, for sure, um, that we have to keep in mind. And in my writing, I really want to think carefully about how I mobilize and, and bring in these different um, subjectivities that, that often have very little relevance to my own genealogy. So the big part for me in my own writing is I'm constantly putting in my biography um, um, my interactions, my connections with this particular artist who I've known for 10 years. Uh, you know, all of those, uh, those connections are important to um, thinking about the work and, and why I have any interest in them um, uh, in some way, not ignoring my own subjectivity, I guess, which is a typical thing often in, uh, again, scholarship where the, um, the author kind of removes themselves. But here it's about entanglement. It, it very much is about making things messy and that means sometimes it's going to go wrong as well. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, um, it's productive, productive mess, maybe. I mean, in, in, yeah. in a most positive sense. Uh, Moad, you, you, you might you want to come in there. And I suppose, yeah, and I suppose it's kind of um, to, in a sense, challenge the comment around, like, to think through new ideas. And I suppose in, in, in the way in which Nidhi and I have really trying to, like, grapple with a lot of the kind of topics we brought up is actually thinking of old you know, ideas that actually had existed, right? And so far as like, you know, a lot of things that we were thinking through are things that have, you know, a very long, um, a long kind of duration, a long past. Um, and, and, and in a sense, to answer that question on relationality, it's kind of um, thinking through the context of North Africa to then the Indian Ocean as the, you know, ways in which that entanglement within Sufi theology actually crosses these vast distances and has crossed them. Um, and as we kind of noted in the kind of, you know, far prior to European expansion. And so actually this question of like doing work or thinking through or thinking with others, you know, is, is a method in which had already, um, you know, pre-existed and kind of really been engaged with before kind of um, these disciplinary notions and these kind of area studies um, demarcations came about, right? And so I think it's also to really take on that and to take that on in a very, um, in a very kind of contemporary sense, right? Because in a sense, it's like, for example, the sailors that we kind of um, are, you know, trying to orbit around in a way um, are these incredibly savvy and innovative figures, right? And so there's also this kind of moment in which these things coalesce, clash, change, alter. Um, and that's where, for example, the work of Sylvia Winter actually for us is such a generative moment of entering into these things. You know, not only in the ways in which she thinks through um, narrating and storytelling as a way in which the world is actually created, right? And that kind of breakdown of science and social constriction that she, she brings in, but also um, in the fact that it's, it's something that really is, um, yeah, like that's something that's already embedded within so many of these things that like um, where, yeah, I suppose orbiting here is and navigating around. Um, but I don't know, did he, because, yeah, I mean, there's, there's so much more to say to this, but... No, but yeah. navigation really is the key, isn't it? It's such a such a beautiful mode to think through how we learn, even. Nidhi, you were saying, you were, you were adding to that. No, no, please go ahead, actually. No, please. No, over to you. <laughs> no, I was, I was just thinking, you know, about this question around positionality, and there's this whole sort of... I mean, this is a bit of a controversial thing to say, but in a sense that we think so much about our own positionality and how we see ourselves and our work. But simultaneously as an anthropologist, I'm really interested in how the people I work with actually see me and how they figure out how I enter into their world, right? So what is the idiom through which they are viewing us and the way we are working with them? And some of the things that like, I mean, it's not in this work, but it's in some of the other work that I've been doing, around like questions of hospitality and patronage, right? Like what are the pre-existing idioms? We don't just come in as the first strangers to, you know, enter this world or to, to talk to these people. That's just not the case, especially in the Indian Ocean, which has this very long history of sort of connection and, you know, making the familiar strange and the strange familiar actually mm -hmm. both ways. Um, so how is it that we can actually take seriously the modes with which the folks that we work with actually think about our positionality and how we enter into those worlds as well? And I think part of, you know, I mean, just going back to your previous question, which I think is one that many of us working in different kinds of oceans are thinking about and the linkages between the Indian Ocean, the Atlantic, the Pacific, right? There's this whole body of work around thinking about the continuous ocean and how you cannot actually separate them, right? Rani Samawani talks about this. There's mm -hmm. you know, a whole group of, of folks thinking through this. So I think this, this kind of division, um, it's important in the sense that we need to think, you know, trans-regionally, locally, regionally, trans-regionally, mm -hmm. and then more capaciously about what oceans do and what they mean. And I think for our work, it's been pretty clear that thinking through the Caribbean has been generative about actually linking it to a very different kind of epistemology yeah. that is linked historically, but at the same time brings us somewhere else. Yeah. Right? 
No, absolutely. And I think uh, we really uh, would love to hear at this moment also from Lee, because your paper was so, uh, again, potent because it brought into the frame emotions and the value of emotions in, um, you know, we think of epistemology as doing one thing and affect another. And I think this paper was trying to like, really showing how the two can't really be delinked. Um, and um, we'd, I mean, I'd love to hear from you, um, uh, as I'm sure we all would, uh, how, how you would respond to these issues that we've been talking about now. Yeah, definitely. I think um, on the one hand, in, in terms of the conversation on knowledges, and um, you know, this has to do with what um, you were just talking about in terms of emotions, but actually I really wanted to come um, to this panel from the perspective of performance because um, you know, I was specifically interested in um, embodied practices and kind of the knowledges that can be generated around embodied practices. So I think for me, it was very striking also to hear the um, last presentation about the materiality of the boat and also kind of the um, um, discussion about, for instance, the uh, breathing, which was both in um, Alexandra's presentation and in the last presentation. And for me, um, what I am um, thinking about, I think above all is um, how performance is really this um, enactment and this kind of humanism of doing that Mitch Kittrick also mentioned in her keynote. So um, I also wanted to kind of bring that in relation to one of the I don't know if this was a general question, but there was a question about um, um, bringing culture to places like Cuba. So also in our discussion of um, the space of the Black Atlantic, I was thinking of course how um, Gilroy locates in Black diasporic music and these kind of cultural expressions as the way that um, these practices were preserved. So. Um, and then in relation to also the discussion on positionality, I think that for me as someone who um, is still in the middle of her dissertation project and is um, kind of still contending with these, um, the question of institutionalized knowledge formations, I think for all of us, um, it is also a question of how can we um, use diaspora as an analytic to kind of interrupt um, these kind of pre these ge geospatial paradigms that um, through the tracing of these diasporic routes and the ways that we're all kind of grappling with that um, um, interrupt yeah these kind of hegemonic or um, kind of institutionalized formations. I think and, that, you know, yeah. area studies yeah. models, all of that. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. No, that's, I mean, I think that's, yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's something um, really powerful, I think, in the Kittrick's work, um, in a critique of embodied knowledge that I find really kind of engaging, where there's really this idea of, like, the ability to abstract, the ability, as, you know, she quotes Sylvia Winter a lot in terms of language and existence, and not to cast, you know, in the way she writes it in her work, as, you know, the Black body as a site of, in which, like, knowledge is somehow produced, but actually there's, you know, questions around articulation and resistance and other kinds mm -hmm. of like um, very, you know, like in, in, in that sense, linguistic, but also other forms of, um, of, of relating and other ways of not notation exercises, et cetera. And so, I mean, there's something in that that I find really kind of powerful, I suppose, in, in that. And then, and I suppose it, it comes across um, for us in the question of the breath as a way that both becomes material and a metaphor. Right. And so like in Ibn Arabi's world, it's like um, it goes further than the ocean. It's like the whole cosmos is defined of as a kind of divine breath in which, you know, there's a kind of the idea of the un un unarticulated being in which, you know, humans are created as a, as a lone moment of speech or a lone word of, of a kind of divine um, uh, distinction or designation. In which then that for us is actually, you know, literal in the like musical and and performative aspects in which things occur and then becomes you know religious and epistemological and other kind of dimensions that that really break this material metaphor down and and also i suppose just want to point to because it was curious in the papers around like a particular focus on art objects um and then a kind of i suppose um yeah like 
for us, there was this really strong moment in Caribbean thinking and in black radical tradition around sound and music that, you know, within the Indian Ocean has also a really amazing and uh, oftentimes maybe not so um, related, but is actually really kind of, you know, um, is, is really kind of engaging and resonant in those kind of thinking. Um, but I'd, yeah, I don't know, Nidhi, if, yeah, because the, the collective breath is also something that's like a way to just pull down a sail from a boat, right? And that's also how it like, um, yeah. Um, before Nidhi um, takes up that, um, uh, that uh, invitation from Moad to, to continue there, I just want to point to a question that has come for everyone, I imagine. So I'm just going to articulate it because I know um, that uh, Lee, you already spoke to it. Uh, so it's a very general question. Uh, could you speak more about the separation of West African peoples due to slavery and how they were able to bring their culture to places like Cuba? So um, now, where do where do we start? Perhaps is my feeling, but then the question is not to me; it's to all of you. So, um, if anybody wants to, uh, maybe maybe I don't know, Alexandra, if you want to uh, address that um, as best you can. Yeah, well, I guess um, I've been thinking a lot about um, Wilfredo Lam because I just wrote an essay for um, the New Pace Gallery show. And um, thinking about, um, of course, um, the influence of um, Abakwa uh, <laughs> um, uh, culture, um, the fraternities and um, the dance and um, the uh, ceremonies that really influenced him and uh, through uh, his uh, acquaintance uh, Lydia Cabrera's interest as well in that. Um, and, but then also, um, you know, and, and really that being a really important, uh, you know, uh, element in uh, Cuban culture. Um, and then also um, Yoruba religion um, that influenced so many, I mean, just thinking about um, artists um, and definitely a huge influence on uh, Wilfredo Lam and his grandmother having been a priestess within um, the religion as well. And so um, definitely I can see that. But I, I wanted to also um, think about because, you know, oftentimes I'm, I'm writing about um, Chinese Caribbean artists or artists um, that um, have like Asian heritage or background. And, um, and there's the question of what is the Asian-ness, right, of this artist? And for me, it's um, this uh, useless search, kind of, not useless, but um, kind of like, this isn't the question. I think um, the search for the Asian-ness, um, it, it's so essentializing. And oftentimes, like, uh, there, there are these uh, un, unfounded kind of um, claims of, uh, you know, uh, this is the Asianness that I see within the work, um, and and I think within the Caribbean, and also in, in um, it's 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 nebulous. It's not so clear, right? What this Asianness is, right? And this is what we're all talking about. But then, um, in uh, in definitely thinking about um, you know um, Catherine Chan's work, Nicole Awai's work. Nicole has told me before that you know people never ask her about being Chinese, um, and which is interesting. Like, what is the framework that you're coming in? Um, and thinking about uh, Maria Magdalena campos Pons work also with um, Lee, um, but also with, with where Fredo Lam, people always ask about his Chinese-ness and are saying, oh, well, maybe it's this symbol that he uses or this type of like aesthetic that I kind of see of you know, muted tones or something. And, um, but instead of looking at that, looking at the uh, uh, the Cuban uh, or, or Caribbean um, identities that are always, you know, moving and changing, but even the, the Cuban identity is always moving and changing, and his interconnection within that uh, might be more productive. Um, but I just wanted to posit that because that's always something that is asked from me, kind of like, what is the Asian-ness? Um, but it's less the Asian-ness and more you know exactly what you're, uh, we were talking about this you know interrelationship of so so many different um backgrounds influences and um and what is new that actually comes out uh, because what comes out of these practices including Lofreda that we're, I was just mentioning is just something that is so it, it's it's something new and different right um so I just wanted to put that out there because that's something that is always 
kind of asked of me um, in terms of like looking at artists of mixed race backgrounds as well. I and think Lam, kind of yeah, Lam is like such prescient almost, you know, for the conversations we're having today. Um, and um, I think for, for me, that's why like Alpesh, I really do uh, find very fruitful to go back to ideas of creolization, but I do, uh, try to also see what happens if we work with those ideas in other oceanic spaces, which is why the work again uh, from the Tao, you know, um, triggers uh, counter questions in us. Um, what is the value of the breath? Is the breath the breath of the performance of Abakua, for example, or Campo Sponsor's performances, the same quality of breath as in the, 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 the singing we heard from the Tao, you know? Um, we, we have about three minutes <laughs> before we're meant to close. I will articulate a question, which I don't think is perhaps the gift, no pun intended of either of us to answer, but I think it resonates with what we were trying to say earlier. And then there's another very long question. Um, I'm gonna read that one out. The first shorter question is, is there a reason why there were no Caribbean people invited to moderate, curate, or be part of this panel? Um, uh, well, I am simply um, carrying the message of being the moderator here. Um, but I think we've tried in a funny way before this question was asked, we were already you know what I mean, circling it through our discussion on positionality, weren't we? Um, so I think I'm gonna leave it out there because I feel we addressed it in our own ways. And in any case, um, I think um, we, this is about worlding in a way too. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to quickly respond to that. Of course, I, I don't want to, you know, not to give people the chance to say something at this point if they do wish to. Um, Sounds like maybe we 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 have preempted it in our earlier discussion. Alexander, do I feel you want uh, to say something? I, I guess, like um, in terms of um, writing a lot about um, Chinese Caribbean artists and being and writing a lot about Caribbean artists and not being from the Caribbean, um, but having been invited for the opportunity to be able to do research there and talk to artists, um, I'm always very aware of my positionality of not being from the Caribbean. Um, and that I'm in conversation with the artists. And so I think um, that's something that's really important. Um, and also just as an art historian, you know, that really relies a lot on our oral history um, as well in interview. Um, like I, I, I am very aware <laughs> of, um, you know, that, you know, I, I hope that I'm not, you know, um, being the voice of the other, right? Of, of, of um, the people that I'm trying to like actually um, bring um, uh, bring the works in uh, 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 present the works of, um, but at the same time, um, I also uh, you know uh, want to provide opportunities that I know that I can provide as an art historian or an arts administrator, and so I always like think about that also when curating artwork. Um, so I just wanted to put that in there, but at the same time, I mean there are so many people that are very very knowledgeable. Um, that are Caribbean writers, curators, and whatnot. So, um, so that is a good question, I think, that the person did pose. Well, it's certainly one that we need to keep asking and use as a mode of self-interrogation and uh, talking to each other about. There are so many questions that have come in just as we have run out of time. I don't know what to do, and they're all exceedingly complex. I'm going to try to boil them down quickly and at least throw them out there for people to pick up, you know, as a, as a kind of last minute gifts. <laughs> from the body of the of the screen. So we've got one from Francisca Koch, who I'll, I'll just condense it. Basically, it's a question to Lee um, about the language of um, Campos Pons talking about mm -hmm. regalos, um, the notions of the gift, um, uh, which translate into German, more or less like bounty and the taking. And she's really wondering about whether this is about gift being a remuneration people would get for capturing another human being. Uh, and also she was interested in the idea of alchemy. Um, I, I think we can all read the questions from the Q&A, so I'll leave that there for uh, Lee to think about while I also go quickly to Sadhana Jain's question, which is another very interesting one about whether sound in relation to the body can have a past. So again, the idea of temporality and ephemerality, I guess, which Sadhana adds 
could be a useful mode of disruption. Somebody can pick that up. And we've got one from Sarah Ibanez O'Donnell, who also wants to ask Lee in particular about her relationality in relation to the subjectivity she's writing with. How do you relate to these embodied performative practices in order to write with rather than about? And Nidhi, also a question for you. You'd like, she'd like to know more about your autoethnographic practices. I'm going to give everyone like half a minute <laughs> to address each. Otherwise, I think we're never going to make the next panel. Um, who would like to go? Maybe Lee, you want to quickly go to the question of a couple of questions for you? And then yeah, we'll um, this is a great question. Thank you so much. Um, and the question about the bounty, um, I actually, that's a very good question that I hadn't necessarily thought about that usage of the word in particular, but it is true that it carries um, multiple connotation and invokes multiple grammars. I was very interested in kind of the dialogue with um, Spillers and um, Campos Pons' kind of um, performatives in the sense of the speech acts that she is also performing the uh, in regalos, such as when she proposes herself as a taking. That's kind of an axis around which I approach the performance. So I think that um, with, and this kind of dialogues with the second, my answer to the second question as well, in terms of um, thinking with, and also um, writing with and about performance is that I think performance really, um, actually reorients us and forces us to contend with what is happening, right, in the space and to move beyond the descriptive, which is also kind of um, something that uh, uh, Catherine McKittrick was talking about in her keynote that really um, stuck out to me. So um, for me, in terms of uh, in terms of my approximation to Campos Ponza's work, I'm very interested um, specifically in um, why uh, she chooses to do performances in certain kind of um, in certain kind of um, exhibitions or or such versus um, her other kind of um, mediums and and she has said of course that she does performance only when her own body needs to be in that space so I think uh, the point of departure for my thinking about regalos was also what is at stake in her placing her own body um, in that space and kind of conjuring uh, this memory of um, of the boat and the um, Atlantic passage through her body and then and then using performance to, as I said, kind of um, counteract some of those violences, but also, of course, um, contend with them. So um, that's kind of, I guess, a, a quick answer to both. Thanks a lot. Uh, and maybe there's, a, yeah, we have a minute for Nidhi because we've been allowed to go over to the 20 past mark. Um, well, thank you for that question on, you know, autoethnography and methods and so on. And I think, yes, autoethnography has been sort of, you know, part of how I'm thinking about some of this work, but I think one way in which, again, Caribbean thought comes into play is like, what is the relationality there, right? Because I think there's a way in which some of the ways in um, some of how I have been able to relate to the sailors that I work with, all of them are men. And like some of the ways in which I have, you know, thought about this is through idioms that make sense historically in the context in which I work. So it's autoethnographic, yes, but I think I'm much more interested in concepts that hold beyond, you know, my singular interaction or multiple interaction with, with the people I work with. So I'm much more interested in placing also my interactions with them within larger Indian Ocean idioms, um, like hospitality, like patronage. And I've written about this, some of this in, in other work, but I think there's a way in which also, I mean, I'm sure Moad has experienced this when he was in India doing some of this work around like, you know, how does a stranger actually become part of, or in some ways able to work with, um, with these sailors who are accustomed to dealing with strangers all the time, right? So this is part of where the context in which we work actually does shift the way we're thinking about our own positionality, right? That's really the question that I'm interested in, as opposed to, you know, I think there's there's the positionality, but then there's a larger context that does not come from an academic context, but in fact, to the world in which we live and work. 
um, apart from the academic context. And people like Kamla Visveswaran have written about this. And I think that's actually very generative to, to think with is that we're not just coming to our work as people who are scholars, but also come from you know a variety of other backgrounds and we're seen differently not just as as scholars but as people who come from different places and have different positionalities within those spaces in which we work so how can we think about the idioms with which you know our the people we work with actually view us um and work with us i don't know if moad wants to also chime in on this or i think we may have to um, alas, draw a line under this conversation, even though we would have loved to have more than indeed all of us uh, continue because we have gone two minutes past the extra time that was given us. Um, there has been a final question again uh, from Helen Starr, continue, who asked the first question about why there was nobody from the Caribbean either speaking or moderating. And um, she has said that, um, yes, um, she is spe specifically asking about a moderator in order to bring rigor into the symposium and not to replicate the very systems that Winter asks us to guard against. Now, since I am the moderator, <laughs> as well as the person chairing, I guess I must uh, give my version of a response. Again, you know, not all of us can uh, be from everywhere, but we can try to understand what it is to connect or relate to other places, places other than the ones that we are geneal genealogically or biologically connected to. Um, the Entering the Caribbean for me uh, had ha, has been a gift actually, and it has transformed completely the way I, 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 I think about myself in the world, historically, philosophically, and 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 in an embodied way. So uh, I at least I'm grateful for being allowed the opportunity to to conduct this conversation with all of you. And all we can do is keep talking because we don't live in separate boxes. And relation is uh, even more so in the pandemic driven world uh, become very important. So so we can just be conscientious and in conscience, hopefully there's some rigor and as well as affect and feeling. So on that note, um, I'm going to say thank you again to all of you. Thank you to the organizers. Thank you to our um, participants, our audience. And um, I'm gonna look forward to enjoying the final panel now that we've done our bit uh, as, as panel four. Thank you again, everyone and goodbye. <laughs>